Hi, thank you, Eric. Uh, I'm boring compared to Elizabeth, I'm afraid. Uh, I'm going to be talking about old stuff. And uh, Aristotle, I, I, there's a rationale for this. I, I think that you have, uh, yeah, the state articulates standards and they want their students to be able to uh, use some of the terminology from uh, classical critical theory about tragedy. And there's a way, and I'd like to try and, and I'd like to think that there's a way to do that and talk about Shakespeare without uh, losing the kids and, and, and main, maintaining some sort of engagement with uh, these plays. Uh, Eric's asked me to uh, talk about tragedy today, not concentrating on a specific play, but by uh, addressing uh, oh, uh, the four great Shakespearean tragedies, the big four as they're called, Hamlet, Othello, Lear, and Macbeth. And I'm going to try and do that. Uh, obviously, there's no way to talk about all four of them very quickly. Um, but there's a lot to be said for, for uh, 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 this may seem counterintuitive to you, but uh, to, for, there's a lot to be said for superficial acquaintance. Uh, I, I, I'm a, a, a believer in what uh, Edie Hirsch calls cultural literacy. You want your students, even if they haven't read in detail or in depth Hamlet or Lear, or Macbeth, or Othello. You want them to understand pretty much what's going on in those plays and have some idea of what people are talking about when, for example, they say, oh, well, you better screw your courage to the sticking place. Uh, or, or when they say, oh, that this too, too solid flesh would melt. That you have some idea of, of the kind of reference that that's being made so that they can be informed, so that they, they're, they're conversant. In, in our culture. And I think you know, it, uh, that's a valuable service we can do for our, our kids in schools. And it's something I try and do uh, in, in my classes, as, as um, my colleagues do too. All right, um, I'm starting with this definition from Aristotle, a very famous classical definition. Tragedy is a representation of a serious, complete action which has magnitude in embellished speech with each of its elements used separately in the various parts of the play and represented by people acting and not by narration, accomplishing by means of pity and terror the catharsis of such emotions. And let's start with the end and work our way back. The, the notion of catharsis is crucial to the classical theory of tragedy, and I suppose that the Shakespeare play that you might be familiar with, in, in which this catharsis is most obvious and most compelling and almost unendurable, is King Lear where the, the ending, you have every hope, and you have every reason to hope that Lear and Cordelia will be okay at the end, and that they will be reunited, and that things will work out, and Shakespeare will not let you have that. And he breaks your heart. Uh, and, you know, when Lear comes out with his dead daughter in his arms, saying, howl, howl, it's, it brings down the house inside. You're left desolate. Uh, the notion of this, this kind of catharsis, this cleansing of it, is, is, is I think, it's at, it's at least debatable in your class. Is this something that, that a dramatist should try and uh, achieve? Uh, it, it's, uh, it's a homeopathic notion, this idea that you're going to cause these emotions in the audience in order to purge them uh, from them. And, and I, I, it's, uh, I, I'll tell you one thing, in the 18th century, they didn't play Lear that way. They, 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 they rewrote it. Nahum Tate rewrote the play so that Cordelia was okay and she got married to Edgar at the end and everybody was fine and then Lear could die happy. Uh, and you can understand why. People couldn't stand to watch that play uh, because of the, the, the sorrow. That it's almost apocalyptic. It's the end of the world. And they even say that at the end of the play. Is this the promised end? or an image of that horror. Uh, it's an embellished, right? When, when Juliet, uh, in embellished speech, one of the, th everybody was uh, in the uh, videos that Elizabeth was showing, they, they did a lot of the prologues. There was a repetition of the prologue. No one left, they never did the couplet <laughs> at the end. The which if you with patient ears attend, what here shall miss, our toil will strive to mend. So the idea is you didn't go in Shakespeare's time to see a play. You notice how visual, and, I'm, and that's the language that our children receive 
culture in most predominantly now is vision. But Shakespeare, you went to hear a play uh, it, that's patient ears, not ears that are like, okay, well, I'm being patient, ears that are suffering the language. Uh, when Juliet hears Romeo speak, after only having heard him for a while, she said, my ears have not yet drunk a hundred words of thy tongue's utterance, yet I know thee for Romeo and a Montague. She has patient ears, right? And embellished speech. Your 14-year-old girls don't talk like that. <laughs> they don't have that kind of, they don't measure out their lines. They don't speak in iambic pentameter, uh, they, <laughs> right? It's em People in Shakespeare's plays speak blank verse, unrhymed iambic pentameter, predominantly. That's the idiom uh, that Shakespeare uses. All of the speeches that we're talking about in the afternoon sessions today that I'll, I'll be discussing with you guys are in blank verse, right? To be or not to be, that is the question. Uh, those kinds of speeches, it, it, it's something that uh, Marlowe makes uh, very current before Shakespeare and that Shakespeare adapts. People don't write in rhyme, they use uh, unrhymed iambic pentameter. It's more natural. On the other hand, it's still embellished. Represented by people acting and not by narration. And I guess this is where we need our next slide. And let's see, will it just go like that? I guess it will. Did that work? Good. There's three ways to represent reality, human reality, in words, uh, if you want to have patient ears. Uh, one is narrative, and where you have somebody telling you a story. Um, the poet I, I, I've, I've done most work on, John Milton, is most famous for narrative poetry. Uh, Homer, right? He's going to tell a story about Achilles. He tells you he's going to tell a story of the wrath of Achilles, of arms and the man I sing uh, in the Aeneid, uh, of man's first disobedience in the fruit in Paradise Lost. Epic is the most noble form of narrative. And it's, it's totalizing, right? It, there's always a point of view. The, the narrator is going to tell you. He's recounting. You're in his hands. Lyric doesn't represent an action. Lyric tends to uh, represent uh, an emotion, an emotional response. Maybe the most, uh, the greatest poet in English, for me anyway, uh, of lyric is, is Keats. And he has those four great odes. That's the most noble form for Aristotle of the lyric mode is the ode. Even as epic is, for narrative, the ode is for lyric, right? Oh, you know, my heart aches and a drowsy numbness pains my sense. That the, the four odes that, Shakespeare, uh, that uh, Keats writes express very well a kind of state of emotional being. Drama represents what narrative tells through actors acting. And that's uh, what Aristotle thinks is crucial to the, uh, the genre of drama, the imitation of reality in a drama. And Ham Hamlet actually talks about this. I wrote it down. I may as well use it. Uh, <clears throat> holding a mirror up to nature, showing the age in which we live, its form and pressure. It's a lovely line from Hamlet. Hamlet talking about the art of drama to hold a mirror up to, up to the people and to show the age its form and pressure, you know, how it's making you act, how you live, what, what's, what's special about our time, what, uh, what makes us behave the way we do. All right, well, um, if you want to give the story in a, a dramatic form, you have to still give narrative. There's got to be a, a way to tell the story within dramatic representation, within characters interacting on stage. And that's, uh, this is how narrative gets into drama. Now, the nice thing about a, a, a great artist like Shakespeare is that he manages to be dramatic while he's giving you narrative. There are, I think there's a great scene at the end of Shakespeare's career in The Tempest where he's giving a lot of dramatic exposition, and it really is basically Shakespeare saying, I've done all this before, and I'm not going to do it again. Just listen, and he has Miranda sitting there, and he says, are you listening? Are you listening? I've got to tell you this story. Are you listening? And basically, he's saying it to the audience. Pay attention. I've got to give you this backstory. But here, we've just had a ghost come on stage. This is Hamlet. We've just had a ghost come on stage. We've been scared. And now, Shakespeare's settling us back down. And he's, uh, at the same time he's settling us back down, he's giving us 
uh, information that's vital to the backstory of this play. Uh, our last king, whose image even but now appeared to us, was, as you know, by Fortinbras of Norway, thereto pricked on by a most emulate pride, dared to the combat in which our valiant Hamlet, for so this side of the world, known world, esteemed him, did slay this Fortinbras, who, by a sealed compact well ratified by law and heraldry, did forfeit with his life all those lands which he stood seized of to the conqueror, against the which a moiety competent was gauged by our king, which had returned to the inheritance of Fortinbras had he been vanquisher, as by the same covenant and carriage of the article designed to his fell to Hamlet. Now, sir, young Fortinbras of unimproved metal, hot and full, hath in the skirts of Norway here and there sharked up a list of lawless resolutes for food and diet to some enterprise that hath a stomach in it, which is no other, as it doth well appear unto our state, but to recover of us by strong hands and terms compulsative those foresaid lands so by his father lost. And this, I take it, is the main motive of our preparations. Horatio is answering a question. Why is all this activity going on in, in basically de Denmark's uh, defense industry? And Horatio says, I know. It's because of Fortinbras. But a lot of this information is merely parenthetical. You don't need it. So part of, he's giving you the information you do need. You need, you need to know about Fortinbras. The irony of this speech is Fortinbras is going to take over the kingdom at the end. Uh, we need to know about the old man and the young man, the father and the son, old Fortinbras and young Fortinbras, like old Hamlet and young Hamlet. There are all of these images, these parallel versions of Hamlet that Hamlet has to triangulate his own character off of. Uh, Laertes versus Polonius, Pyrrhus versus Achilles. Uh, in, the, in the player's speech. Hamlet has many, many models, many, many pressures on him to behave in a certain way. And uh, he has to kind of negotiate who he's going to be through those uh, models. Well, when he's, at the same time he's giving you that necessary information about Fortinbras, he's boring you. He's lulling you. He's got lots of parenthetical statements. They're too pricked on by a most emulate pride. You don't need that information who by a sealed compact well ratified by law and heraldry, you don't need that information. Against the which a moiety competent was gauged by our king, which had returned to the inheritance of, you don't need that information, right? He's giving you that information that you don't need because he wants to set you up for the next appearance of the ghost. You're gonna be going, yeah, okay, ghost is gone, yeah, heraldry, yeah, got it, okay. Whoa, the ghost! It's like, <laughs> comes back on the stage again. and. Uh, I think what Shakespeare is doing here, at the same time he's giving you necessary backstory, he's setting you up for another dramatic moment. Uh, you've got similar scenes in Macbeth. You've got uh, when the herald comes in and he says, okay, who's this bloody man? You get this information about the, re the rebellion, about the battle that's occurred, and Macbeth and Banquo's heroism and how they put down the rebels. And you found out about you're going to find out in terms that are sort of equivocal, the irony is that, Ham, that Macbeth himself is going to become a rebel. It, the language of that account suggests as much in ironic ways that you don't immediately, you know, they're dramatically ironic. You don't, they, no one on stage appreciates that at, at the moment. Quick question. Yes. Something like this, when we look at Aristotle's definition, when you have what is essentially narration, that is being provided, is that a way to, to, to push at Aristotle's definition because it's delivered by a character as opposed right. to... Well, this is how you do it in yeah. drama, right? That, it, it, that's why if you want to tell a story, in a drama depends on a story. Right. If, you're, if you're going to tell a story on stage, you need to give narrative to the characters in ways that don't violate the dramatic medium, right? The I dramatic mode. Like, like Crucible, that, that have that narrative interspliced with the, with the dramatic action, which really kind of makes it a weird hybrid thing. Yes, um, well, and, and uh, you know, Aristotle recognized, he loves the purity of genre. He wants drama to be very pure and concentrated in its representationality. It, it, he wants it to be representative to have characters act it out, to show. But he recognizes that there's lyric moments in drama. You know, when, uh, you know what light through yonder window breaks? It, it, yeah. There are lyric moments, there are narrative moments, they're all mixed in, but characters act them out. It's not a narrator saying, and then Romeo said, 
what light through yonder window breaks. You're not getting it from a point of view that's uh, consistently consistent throughout the story. Uh, in Macbeth, in Lear, you get Gloucester's introduction of Ed Edmund. Oh yeah, this is my bastard son. I, you know, I've blushed so often to acknowledge him. I'm brazed to it now. Oh, but the whore son must be acknowledged. <laughs> and it's like Edmund's standing right there. <laughs> And he's, taught, he's introducing him to his friend, his noble friend, Kent. And he said, but he's gone, he's, gonna be, he's been gone all this time, and he's going to go away again. And then you're going to find out that, in fact, he's not going to go away again. He's going to cause havoc uh, and let, <laughs> let slip the dogs of war. Um, in in uh, Othello, you get Othello himself giving you dramatic exposition. Ah, you know, oh, I didn't enchant this girl. Here's the way I wooed her. I told her all of these stories about my past. Oh, hair's breadth scapes an imminent deadly breach. Men whose head do grow beneath the shoulders. The anthropophagi. Uh, that he's telling them how I charmed her. And Iago's there. He's, oh, yeah, that's how you did it. And that's how you got her love. And she loved you for the dangers you had passed. And you loved her for that, sh that she did pity them. He's got, oh, all right. I'm taking this in. I know how to proceed. Uh, again. Dramatic, it's narrative that you need in order to understand what's going on in the story, and it's dramatic because it furthers the plot. All right, uh, let's go on. Let's see if I can actually do it from this side. Huh. These are the six elements of a drama according to Aristotle. Uh, plot, character, thought, diction, melody, and spectacle. The two most important, overwhelmingly important for Aristotle, are plot and character. Uh, and plot is the sine qua non for Aristotle. I mean, he loves plot. Uh, because for him, a, a tragedy in this concentrated purity of form that Aristotle values so highly is like a slow motion train wreck. You see it coming, you know it's going to happen, and you just watch in horror as it occurs. Uh, his, his, the ideal, the model for him is, is uh, Oedipus Rex. Uh, everybody knows what's going to happen in this story. Everybody knows who Oedipus is. The only, person who, <laughs> the only people who don't know are acting it on stage. <laughs> and you're watching it unfold with necessity. It, there's, no, there's no way out of it. It's not like Oedipus can say, maybe I should do this. There's no way out of it. Uh, it, 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 he's going to find out that he's murdered his father and married his mother, and uh, he's going to knock his eyes out at that moment. Uh, it, his character is secondary. The character of Oedipus is important, and Aristotle acknowledges the importance of character, but it's not so important as plot. Uh, thought, you would talk maybe the theme of the play, if you were to discuss it with your students. Any of these terms, the diction, the kind of language we, that they use, in Hamlet, the word is question. Question appears so often in Hamlet, the term question. And that's a good, I think this is a, a useful shorthand for your students. Hamlet, question. Macbeth, blood. Blood is all over Hamlet. Lear, nothing. Right? Nothing. Nothing. Over and over and over again, the word nothing, which is a, a, a wonderfully pregnant word in, in the Elizabethan era. Uh, you look it up. Uh, melody, uh, much more important for Aristotle, I think, than for Shakespeare, where it tends to be more accidental and ephemeral. Uh, in, in Aristotle's, uh, the, the Greek drama that Aristotle talks about tragedy, you have a chorus. They sing, they dance. Uh, they literally, they do. I mean, and people don't realize this. The Greek chorus isn't, isn't, you know, it's more like the pips with Gladys Knight than it is what you're thinking of when you think of the chorus of a Greek drama. They may be serious, but they got, they got their moves for the strophe, and then they do the epode, and then they go the anti-strophe. Uh, and then they're the guy who steps out in front, I mean, of the chorus is being addressed, and they often develop the thought of the play. They comment on the action in a way that allows you to expand from the action to show the age, its form, and pressure. Uh, spectacle is the lowest form. And this is, we value spectacle very highly with our computer-generated effects. Uh, and for, for Aristotle, this is the lowest form, the lowest element, the least important, the least germane to the genre, which is what he's, uh, his criticism is in, intent on uh, relaying. All right, well, let's go forward. Um, 
came through narrative, like the death of, or blinding of Oedipus, or the death of Jocasta. Right, exactly right. The only uh, anecdote I remember about visual spectacle in Greek tragedy is the Furies in the Oresteia, who were apparently the horribly painted green masks with big red tongues lolling out, and boys fainted and women miscarried. Uh, when they saw the Furies rise up in the middle of the Oresteia. Uh, but, and, that, and that was the one visual, I, and I, I think Bill absolutely right, that uh, Dennis is absolutely right, that, uh, and this is true in Shakespeare too, that the, the spectacle tends to be painted in words. Again, let, you know, what you, your patient ears attend what he or she'll miss. Shakespeare draws, makes a lot of scenery with words. Uh, and, he, but he is not adverse to giving spectacle on stage that Aristotle would not give. Aristotle would not allow, and Sophocles wouldn't allow, the, the conventions of the, of the Greek stage wouldn't permit to show a blinding of Oedipus on stage. That's an obscenity. It happens off scene, obscene, right? But in Lear, Shakespeare shows that. I mean, uh, uh, Elizabeth told you about the bear baiting pits. I mean, Shakespeare's south of the city. He's in the suburbs. He's in the entertainment district. This is a very morally suspect occupation in Shakespeare's time. Uh, guys are kissing guys on stage. This is, is not, it's edgy stuff. And it was a brutal, cruel world that Shakespeare lived in. In order to get to his theater, you crossed over a bridge, and on that bridge were heads on pikes, heads of traitors. That, so when you walk onto the stage and you see a young woman, Reagan, and her husband gouging out an old man's eyes on stage, that is not obscene for Shakespeare. Even though by the 18th century people are, again, by the 18th century people are saying, I would not willingly watch that play or read that play again. All right, uh, let's proceed. Um, yes, my dear, I'm aware that I'm... I'm <laughs> <laughs> I don't, want to, I don't want to run over, I really don't. We've got to get this show on the road, right? Uh, Peripatia and anonoresis are the two uh, critical elements for Aristotle. He loved it when the two occurred at the same time. So that uh, the turning point, or the reversal, and the recognition uh, from the same root as ignore, right? You see again, you understand again, recognize. So uh, Oedipus recognizes that he is his wife's son and his father's killer. And, and, and at that very same moment, all of the relations in the play change. He, instead of being the guy who's hunting the murderer of his father, he finds out that he's the, he's the murderer. He's not, he, he is the cause of the, of the calamity that he, as king, is trying to resolve. Uh, it's a, it's a, and Aristotle loved it. He loved the concentration of that moment. And you get such moments in Shakespeare. You get it in Macbeth and you get it in Othello. Uh, in Macbeth, it's like when Mac, Macduff comes on and, and Mac, Macbeth may be surrounded. His castle may be besieged, but he's not worried. It's like, nobody can kill me. I've been told. No one, I'm only going to get killed by someone not of women born. Any of you not of women born, come on over here. <laughs> right? And then Macduff comes up and says, I was from my mother's room, womb untimely ripped. And, and then Mac, Macbeth says, oh no, I've been tricked all along. This was all paltering with a double sense, and I'm done. And he realizes at that moment that he's become, he's gonna, his head's going to be on the pike. And there is, at that moment of recognition, there is a reversal. The same thing happens in Othello when Othello finally, Iago, what have you done to me? At that very moment, all the relations that I'm not the just killer of a straying woman, as if you know, that's a just thing to do. Uh, I am the guy who is duped and torn apart by this evil man. And it's a, it's again, it's a, it's a moment of peripatia and anonoresis all at one. It's at the end of the play, it, and it works. It's very concentrated. It's very emotional, uh, and it. Yeah, I suppose if it's a catharsis, it's a catharsis of pity and fear. I don't think you get that in Lear. In Lear, it's, it's a peripatia and recognition. After peripatia and recognition, it just keeps happening and happening and happening and happening. And you think it's going to end. You think when, when Lear says, you know, oh, I have it written down. When Lear says, after he wakes up from his, his, his bout of madness, he says, I am 
a very foolish, fond old man, fourscore and upward, not a moment more or less. And to speak plainly, I fear I am not in my perfect mind. He says that to his daughter, you know, I know who you are. There is that, like, oh, you're so happy, you know, you hope it's going to work. And then it doesn't. And he sees, you know, she's dead. It's a terrible scene. All right. Uh, our final moment here is, I think it's a, I think this is a, an important way of looking at the difference between Greek and, and Elizabethan, Jacobean tragedy, Shakespeare. The two great flowerings of tragedy, they both grow out of religious traditions. One's the festival of Dionysus and the other is, is uh, the story of Christ, really. It, uh, uh, medieval drama starts on Easter morning. Right? It, like, who, where, where's the body in the tomb? It's like, where's Jesus? Where's the, where is the, the dead guy? And he's not there. And that's the drama starts from that moment. And Greek tragedy, similarly, is about a dying and a rising God, Dionysus, who is, who's twice born. Uh, but Greek, the Greek culture doesn't really have an idea of free will. They don't have a concept for free will. They don't have terminology or vocabulary of free will. This is something that develops and is very important by the time you get into the Middle Ages. The scholastic theologians are always trying to talk about this faculty of, the free, of free will. And it's important in Christian theology, the notion of, of ra reason versus volition, the rationality, how sin comes about. For the Greeks, hamartia, the notion of sin, is simply missing the mark. It's not a, a, a volitional like, I'm going to do something bad. It's not, I'm going to do something I know I shouldn't do. And, and Socrates even says as much. Nobody's going to do something that they think is wrong. Nobody's going to do something that's irrational or that they think is bad for them. And uh, <laughs> Christian theology s suggests otherwise, right? Say, uh, the epistles of Paul say, the good that I would do, I do not. Now, Shakespeare is, I think, very aware of this the, the flux of interiority, right? That, that sort of that state of otherness that's always inside us. And he develops it, I think the Shakespeare, what is the, 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 the quintessential Shakespearean effect is this sense of, I could do this, and I could do something else. And I think that's most apparent. He discovers it, really, and really runs with it in Hamlet. And I think the bottom line, right, the bottom line speech for Hamlet, for this way of looking at character, is the to be or not to be speech. It, it's, and that, there's a reason why it's the most fa famous dramatic speech in the language. Because it's the bottom line. What am I going to do today? Am I going to kill myself or am I going to go on living? That's the real otherness, right? If you, every day you make that choice, if you're Hamlet, to be or not to be. That is the question, whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune or to take arms against a sea of troubles, and by opposing, end them. Oh, I got that right. Mm -hmm. To die, to sleep, and by a sleep we mean to say an end to the heartache and the thousand natural shocks that flesh is heir to. Tis a consummation devoutly to be wished. To die, to sleep. To sleep, perchance, to dream, ah, there's the rub. For in that sleep of death, what dreams may come when we have shuffled off this mortal coil must give us pause. There's the respect that makes calamity of so long life. For who would bear the whips and scorns of time? The oppressor's wrong, the proud man's contumely, the pangs of disprized love, the law's delay, the insolence of office, and the spurns that patient merit of the unworthy takes, when he himself might his quietus make with a bare bodkin. Who would fardels bear to grunt and sweat under a weary life, but that the dread of something after death, the undiscovered country from whose born no traveler returns, puzzles the will and makes us rather bear those ills we have than fly to others we know not of. Thus conscience doth make cowards of us all. And thus the native hue of resolution is sicklied o'er with the pale, pale cast of thought. And enterprises of great pith and moment with this regard, their currents turn awry and lose the name of action. Now, I, I've, 
went through that mostly from memory, simply because I would like to recommend to you as teachers of Shakespeare that you ask your students to memorize a speech from Shakespeare. And memorize it so that they know what they're saying. Uh, like Elizabeth, my, my practice here today in, in, in trying to help you teach Shakespeare is informed by what I do teaching Shakespeare. And the, my most recent experience was in England with a group from UT, and we went to the plays. And, it, what, and I asked my students to memorize, and I, I, I made them memorize. Uh, they got to choose the speeches, and that was, you know, they had, their, their, they had some autonomy, but they did need to memorize the speech, some speech. And it works wonderfully, because you, you're not just saying, to be or not to be, I mean, when you're reading it on the page without ever saying it, you're not getting it. And, but when you put it in your head, you recognize how blank verse works, and you understand the character. If you understand what the words mean as you say them, it changes the whole ball game uh, for a student. It engages them. And uh, if they, if you, especially if you can get kids to memorize speeches from the same scenes together and try and actually do, you don't have to do great stretches of it. You don't have to do big performances. But they will understand. It works. It still works. It may just be words but it works. Uh, I take it from me. I, I would, I was, when I was working with my students this uh, summer in, in England, I was thinking of how great it would be to work if you could just do it, you know, and I know you can't, but get a group of really talented high school kids together and just work on a play and have them try and figure out exactly what the words mean as they're saying them. It's a, it's a big empowerment for kids to be able to get to that point, I, uh, uh, and I recommend it. I, I think that it's an experience that if you do encourage them and help them to achieve it, that they won't forget it. They may hate you while they're doing it, <laughs> but, but they will love you afterward uh, and, and, and for a long time afterward. Okay, well, I'm done. And I want to ask you if you have questions, and I'll, I'll do my best to try and answer them. I